we're in 2 Samuel chapter 7. If you want to open your Bibles there, we'll continue in our study through the book of 2 Samuel. Title of the message today is When God Says No. When God Says No. How many of you have had God say no to you? That's a lousy thing, isn't it? When God says no. Maybe you had a desire, you, you know, you wanted a job and God said no. Or you wanted a house, it was your dream home. And God said no. Maybe even today your great desire is to have children and so far God has said no. God says no to us and uh, it hurts when, when, when God says no. And today we're going to look at how do we handle that? How do we handle it when God says no? What, what is the way that we should move forward and what should our perspective be? You know, I remember my kids um, growing up and... And they're all grown now, obviously, and kids of their own. And grandbaby number eight just came a couple of weeks ago. Thank you, Jesus. So that's all good. But, uh, you know, I remember one particular situation. My girls had something that they wanted to go to. I can't remember what it was, but they really wanted to go. And, um, and we told them no. And they, they were really upset about it. But what my kids didn't know is that the reason my wife and I told them no is that we had a Disneyland trip planned. And we were going to surprise them with this trip to Disneyland. And so as upset as they were, they found out in time that our plan for them was so much more than what they had planned. Uh, and oftentimes that's the case when God says no to us. We don't always get the perspective uh, of why God says no. He doesn't, he doesn't always tell us, but usually in time uh, we get to reflect on what happened and we get to see why God said no, and in general, we find out that his no's are uh, really for our best, and we're grateful for that. So we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at three things. We're going to see uh, in David's life, we're going to see David's desire, we're going to see David's duty, uh, and we're going to look at David's destiny. We'll start off, your note taker, you write it down, David's desire, Second Samuel chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass when the king, David, was dwelling in his house... And the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. And then Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. David's now on the throne of Israel, and God is blessing his socks off. Uh, he's united the nation both politically and spiritually. We looked at last week how he went about uniting the nation spiritually, uh, that he went and he got the Ark uh, of the Covenant from, from uh, Kiriath-Jerim, and he brought it up uh, to Jerusalem. Now, I explained last week, the Ark was a box that uh, God had instructed the Israelites to build back in Exodus 25. Um, God instructed Moses, make the ark out of acacia wood, cover it in solid gold, um, and uh, the top of it uh, was, was known as the mercy seat. Two cherubim at the top uh, facing inward, and there in the, between them was what was known as the mercy seat. This was the place uh, where the Jews would meet with God in their worship. The high priest would sprinkle blood from the sacrifice seven times on the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement. And in that, the ark was a picture of Jesus Christ. Being constructed of wood symbolized the, the humanity of our Lord and Savior, that he was fully man. Being covered in gold, the deity of Jesus, that he is fully God. Um, that uh, there on, on the top being, you know, the, the, the mercy seat, this place where, uh, where man would meet with God. And the context of the ark, among other things, was the law of God, the, the, the tablets of stone that Moses had brought down, having the Ten Commandments on them. And the picture of Jesus is this, that as we come to God, we have to approach God by the mercy seat of Christ. The sprinkling of blood on that mercy seat, symbolic of Jesus' blood shed on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word sin means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. And so the, the contents of the ark symbolize God's holy standard. They, that, this is the law of God. God gives us his law to show us that ain't one of us able to keep his law. That he is holy, he's pure, he's righteous. And we are none of those things. And so because we are powerless to keep the law, 
God gave Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You do a job, you want to get paid on payday, that's your wages, that's what you've earned. And what you and I have earned, because we are sinners by nature and by choice, well, we've earned death. But God has placed between us and the law the man Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. And so we come to God by the mercy seat. And this is the only way that we can meet God. Because our lives don't meet meet the righteous requirement of the law. And so God can't meet with us apart from this mercy seat of Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul said this to Timothy. He said, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And so as long as that mercy seat is in place between you and the law, you can meet together with God. So often people have the attitude that they say, you know, why should I go to heaven? Well, you know, because I'm basically a good person. No, the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. People say, well, I'm going to heaven because I keep the Ten Commandments. No, no, you're not, because you don't always keep the Ten Commandments. And so, so this, is, this is our hope. And so here's David in our text. He's, he's resting in his house, and, and he's brought the Ark of the Covenant, the center of their worship, back to Jerusalem, un- unified the nation politically and spiritually, all the tribes together. And now he's sitting in this house that the king of Tyre built for him. Now, you'll recall the king of Tyre built a house of cedar. And what you need to understand is that cedar was really pricey. Nobody built their house entirely out of cedar. David is sitting in a palace. He is blessed abundantly by God. And it starts to get to him. He's sitting there. And as he's sitting there, it comes to this, he, the thought comes to him, here I am sitting in this amazing house, and God's out there in a tent, right? And, and so, you know, with this attitude, you understand, when, when Israel was in the wilderness, God not only commanded Moses to build the ark, but he also commanded him to, to make a tent for the ark to reside in. And, and, and this tent that, 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 that he instructed him to make, it was called the, the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. And this is what David now has built in Jerusalem to house the ark that he's brought in. He's, he's constructed a tabernacle according to the Lord's instruction to Moses. And so there the ark is in this tabernacle, but it's a tent, and David sitting in his house thinks, God deserves more than that. I, I got a gorgeous house, and here, here's God out, you know, in a tent. And, uh, and so David, you know, certainly he understands that God's, it's, God's a lot bigger than that. When he says, you know, God's out there in a tent, he understands that God dwells in the, on the throne of heaven, that, that his house is, is opulent and splendid and, and, and so on. But you get the idea. He's thinking, well, gosh, the ark of God deserves more than just this, this tent that, that we've, we've set up. So David here has a good desire, and we need to take note of that. The desire of David's heart is beautiful. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus was talking to his disciples about trusting and serving the Lord. And he introduced the idea of stewardship. Now, stewardship, the, the attitude of stewardship is, is just, just this, to, to, to acknowledge what I own, what I possess, ultimately it really doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. Everything that God has blessed you with, everything that God has blessed me with, a, a job, a home, children, grandchildren, whatever, whatever, you know, as you take the time to fill out the list of all the blessings, which is a healthy practice, by the way, just to reflect on how God's blessed you. But as you take the time to consider that and, and all that, you know, God has given to you, well, Jesus is saying that, that there's a stewardship responsibility. That, look, ultimately that's been entrusted to you. It really belongs to somebody else. And so a steward, his job or her job is to manage that which they don't own, but that they've been entrusted with. And so as Jesus introduces this idea of stewardship to his disciples in Luke chapter 12, he tells them a parable. A parable's a, a, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so he's talking about, you know, a steward. And he concluded his parable uh, saying this. Put on the screen for you, Luke chapter 12, verse 42. Uh, It says, And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper 
time. When he says their portion of food, he's not just talking about your portion of food. He's talking about those that, you know, have also been entrusted to you. You not only got to feed yourself, dads, you got to feed your kids, you got to take care of your wife, and so on, to give them their portion of food at the time. Blessed is that servant, Jesus said, whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Now Jesus said this in response to a question from Peter, because Peter hears this story and he basically says, well, wait a minute, Jesus, is this just for us or is this for everybody? And so Jesus is saying, essentially, look, this is for everybody. God's blessed you, he's given you stuff, and, and you have to keep in your mind's eye, it, ultimately this belongs to God, and so God's given it to me, he wants me to use this wisely for his glory, for his kingdom. Jesus told another parable about a guy who gave talents to each one of of his servants. And, you know, one guy went out and he invested his talents, doubled it. God says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, enter into your master's happiness. Second guy, he, you know, fewer talents, but still given talents. He went out, invested those, got the same response from God. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's happiness. But the third guy, he buried his talent. And, and basically, and he, and he says, look, I knew you to be, to be a harsh master when his master comes back and goes, what's up, man? Where's, where's, where's that, the goods that I entrusted to you, the talent that I entrusted to you? He's like, oh, I knew you to be, you know, a, a, a harsh uh, master, uh, sowing, or, you know, reaping where you have not sown, and so on. And, and basically, the attitude, the idea was this guy with his own mouth was saying, look, I knew that you expected something in return, but I was afraid to go out and invest it, so I buried it. And the, the, the Lord's response was, you wicked and lazy servant. You know, he did not get the same response that, uh, that this other, uh, these other men had gotten. And so Jesus, he's telling now this story about stewardship, and, and he goes on, he's, he talks about a man who abused his, stu- his <clears throat> stewardship, who mistreated his servants, who kept the blessings that had been entrusted to him to himself, and he says that that man was destroyed. And here's how Jesus concluded uh, what he was saying to his disciples in Luke's gospel. He said, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return, and when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. And this is David's attitude here. David, he's sitting in his palace, and he's thinking, man, I've been given much. So what can I do with it to bless God? This is his heart. This is his attitude. Commendable attitude. Something that we should all emulate. And a good point here in in our text, just maybe to you in your notes, jot down a question, take a walk with this week. Do you have a desire to bless God as he's blessed you? Do you have a desire to bless God? Do you have occasion to be able to consider how God has blessed you and what he might require of you in return? Paul told the Ephesians, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He went on to say, In him also we've obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And a little bit further on to the Ephesians, he says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, we are blessed to be a blessing. And so this is David's heart. This is the desire of his heart. And he shares this desire with Nathan the prophet. Now, this is the first mention of Nathan in in 2 Samuel. This is the first mention of Nathan in, in the Bible. He just sort of drops onto the page. But apparently, Nathan served as a prophet of God to David during David's reign. And Nathan was a godly man. He's the guy who's going to confront David when he falls into sin with Bathsheba here in a few chapters down the road. Nathan's the guy who is going to see to it that Solomon is crowned king after, Nathan, or after David. Nathan's the guy who here in our text is going to deliver the bad news to David because he's got a desire to build this temple. And Nathan, as we're going to see, he originally says, yeah, go for it. But what happens there is that Nathan is told subsequently that he can't do it. We all need Nathans in our lives. 
Another just sort of sub point, not the main point of the text, but something to consider. Do you have a Nathan in your life? Do you have somebody who can tell you what you need to hear and not necessarily what you want to hear? We, we like to accumulate those people around us that tell us what we want to hear. But we need a Nathan in our life who's going to tell us what we need to hear. And so to David's credit, he comes to Nathan. He's not looking for what he wants to hear. He truly is seeking Nathan. When he goes to Nathan and says, oh, here I am. I'm I'm dwelling in a palace. And God's out there in a tent. Nathan gets what he's saying. He's like, I want to build a temple for God. And so Nathan's response is, he's like, man, go for it. Look, I don't, even, I don't need, even need to check in with God on this one. Go for it, David. That's what he says to him. Do all that's in your heart. But it happened that night, verse 4, that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build a house for me to dwell in? Sounds like a question, it's not. He's telling him, no. He says, would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I've not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. And nearby, you might want to circle that word tabernacle, and you could, you could write John 1.14 next to us. It's a cool verse. It tells us there in John's gospel opens up saying the word became flesh. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt means tabernacled. He made his tent among us. It's speaking of Jesus Christ. This beautiful thing. And so the Lord says, look, I've, you know, I, I've not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. That tent, that tabernacle being a picture of Jesus Christ who is to come. Verse 7, wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? I've never said that. I've never said, hey, man, I want a house. Why haven't you built me a house? Now, therefore, verse 8, thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you've gone. I've cut off all your enemies from before you, and I've made you a great name like the name of the great men who are on the earth. And moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will, and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. He's talking about the promised land for, for Israel. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously, Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the son of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. And according to all these words and according to all this vision... So Nathan spoke to David. And that's an indication there. He he spoke all of these words and he he further articulated this vision that God had given to him. And we're going to see in uh, in, uh, 2 Chronicles that that God really spoke a whole lot more uh, to David about this particular thing. And so Nathan shared the whole thing with God, basically saying, look... This is, this, this is a great desire, but it's not God's desire that you should do, David. God's got other plans for you. Which brings us to our second point. If you're taking notes, not only David's desire, but now we look at David's duty. David had a beautiful desire. 
And so this is the desire he articulates to Nathan. Nathan says, yeah, dude, go for it. And then God speaks to Nathan and basically says, no, 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 you spoke too soon. You weren't, you weren't speaking for me. Let me give you a chance to get this right, Nathan. Here's, here's my heart on the matter. And so God's response to David, he says, look, David, I've been with you wherever you've gone. I took you from tending sheep, man. You were, you were out in the, the field tending sheep, the lowliest thing, by the way, that, that, a, that a Jew could do would be out there in the field with a sheep. Samuel the prophet comes to the house of Jesse. He's like, hey, looking for the guy that God wants to anoint, you know, for, as the future king of Israel. And Jesse starts bringing his sons out, starts with Eliab. Eliab is this tall, good-looking guy. And Samuel's like, surely this is the guy, man. I mean, if, I, if I'm going to central casting looking to cast for a king, Eliab would, would be, man, he'd get the job. God's like, nope, didn't, I, haven't, I haven't chosen him. And he, he would go on to say, you know, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And they go through all of his seven sons, and God's like, one by one, nope, that's not him, nope, that's not him, nope, that's not him. It's kind of a Cinderella sort of deal. Who's the slipper going to fit? And, and Samuel's like, you got any more sons? And Jesse's like, yeah, just the youngest. And, and, and the word youngest means not only that he was the youngest chronologically, it also kind of infers that he was the least in his father's estimation. And certainly he was. His dad wouldn't even bring him for consideration. He's like, oh, yeah, there's the youngest. He's out there in the field stinking up the field with the sheep. And he's like, bring him here, man. We're not going to sit down until, until you brought him in. And the guy walks in. It's David. And God says, rise and anoint him. He's the one. And so God tells David, man, I took you out of the field from tending sheep. I called you from obscurity and the most lowly position. I did that. I've given you great victory, David. I've given you a great name. I'm going to use you to secure a place of rest for my people. And I love your heart to build me a house. But I never asked you to do it. He says, I'm not going to use you to build my house. I'm going to use your son. Now, why did God say no to David's beautiful offer to build him a house? There's a couple of reasons for this. Here's the first reason. first reason is because David was a man of war. He had blood on his hands. And God wanted to use a man of peace to build his temple. And we know this because in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, David's speaking to his son Solomon. And he, and he tells him there, he says, and, and David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house to the name of the Lord my God, but the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have, have made great wars. You shall not build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. We don't read that here in the account of 2 Samuel, but we do see that uh, Nathan goes to him and shares with him all of these words that we read in 2 Samuel and according to all the vision. So, there, so this in 1 Chronicles is articulating all of that vision. It's telling us this is why God said no. Hey, listen, you know, you've you, you got blood on your hands. And uh, he goes on to say, uh, Behold, a son shall be born to you, who shall be a man of rest, and I'll give him rest from all his enemies all around. His name shall be Solomon, which literally means peaceful, uh, for I will give peace and quietness to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now, it's been said that often our appointments begin with disappointments. Our appointments begin with disappointments. And God wanted a man who built his temple to be a man of peace and to live live in peace. And this wasn't David. It was disappointing to David because he really had this strong desire to build this house for God. But listen, this wasn't God's, God's appointing for David. See, because he wants to establish the nation of Israel in a land of peace. And so David... Yes, he'd, he'd waged much war. He has blood on his hands. And, and so he can't build the, the temple, which needs to be established by a man of peace. But he does need to be a man of war to secure the peace. Because we're going to see there's more wars that are going to be in the future. As a matter, matter of fact, in the very next chapter, David is going to wage war against seven nations. He's going to defeat all of them. And so his work of securing the peace in the land is still being done. 
as he continues clearing that land, making the path, setting the stage so that Israel can be secure and in peace for the man of peace who will build the temple. In other words, God has assigned David to a different duty. David has a desire to build a temple, but God says, look, i got to use you for something else. Think about it. David was a shepherd. What does a shepherd do? Well, among other things, they tend the sheep. They, they lead them through dangerous territory in search of pasture, right? And, and they, they fight predators. You know, David, he would say when he was going to fight Goliath, when I tended my father's sheep, I fought the lion and the bear. So this is what they would do. You know, the, the, David would write the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me be, beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name. Say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. David, a shepherd, talking about what a shepherd does, likening God to being that great shepherd. But David himself is a man that God's made to be a shepherd. He knows what it is to take sheep through a land where there's enemies that want to devour them, where there's, there's wild animals that want to devour them. He knows what it is to have to fight those wild animals off. And so God has uniquely gifted David and uniquely called David not to build a temple, but to shepherd and protect the people and to set the stage and to be able to do that work through which he lays the groundwork for his son to build the temple. Reminds me of a story I heard about a guy named Oswald Smith. Here was a guy back in the early 1900s. He had a great desire to be a missionary. And yet, <clears throat> he, he failed at his efforts to become a missionary. He, he appeared before different missions boards, and he was rejected. And he was rejected, and he was rejected. Not allowed to go on the mission field where his heart longed for. Why? Well, Obviously, by the guy's story and by his life, God hadn't called him to that. He subsequently wound up being called to pastor a, a church. And in his, in his pastoring this church, what he did was the church, as it was built up and established, they sent out multiple missionaries. They were highly successful in mobilizing missionaries all across the world. And see, so his desire was to be a missionary, but his duty was to be a missionary equipper and sender. He wasn't given the duty to go himself, but God knew what he was doing because of his great desire that he placed on his heart, but his duty then come together and causing him to do so much more for the kingdom of God than he ever imagined that he could possibly do. Maybe today, you might fall in this camp. Maybe today you have some sort of a great desire, but it is in conflict with the duty which God has called you to do. Maybe you long to be a missionary, but your wife and Ted ki 10 kids aren't, aren't, aren't thrilled with the idea. You know, maybe just circumstantially, you're not able to do that. Well, what you can do, you can help somebody else to be a missionary. You can support a missionary. Maybe, you know, your desire... You want children. God, you know, you said be fruitful and multiply. I have this great desire to, to have children. And maybe so far God has said no. And, and who knows, but, but that you can take that desire and you can use it in other different ways. And you can honor God in different ways. Maybe, you know, getting involved in a pro-life group or getting involved in our mops ministry or children's ministry or, or adopting a child. Maybe God has, you know, a different duty called for you. This is exactly what we see David do. He prepared for his son's work. 1 Chronicles 29 gives us a glimpse of that. He's talking to the nation of Israel. Listen to what he says. Throw it on the screen for you. He says, Now for the house of my God, I have prepared with all of my might gold for things to be made of gold, silver for things of silver, brawn for things of brawn, iron for things of iron, wood for things of wood, onyx stones, stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones, and marble slabs in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of God, I've given to the house uh, of my God over and above all that, that, that I've prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver, 3,000 talents of gold, 
of the, the gold of Ophir and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the houses, the gold for things of gold, the silver for things of silver, and for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of craftsmen. Then he asks the Israelites this question, who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? David is just saying, look, I've got this great desire. God told me I couldn't do it, that he had a different duty for me to perform, and I'm going to focus on doing that duty. But at the same time, I can still give where my desire is to, to help my son to build the temple. F.B. Meyer said this. He says, if you cannot have what you hoped, do not sit down in despair and allow the energies of your life to run to waste but arise and gird yourself to help others to achieve. If, uh, if you may not build, you may gather materials for him that shall. If you may not go down the mine, you can hold the ropes. And you know, in a way, as I, as I think about this and as I was reading this, I was thinking about how we've experienced this as a church. You know, Temecula Community Church had a great desire to build a house of worship to the Lord there on Santiago Road. And, and they gave of, of, their, of their resources and so on. They, they secured the property there. They began to develop the property there. And they came to a place where they recognized, you know what, our desire doesn't, doesn't match right now what our duty is. And so the elders of that, cho- that church made a, a very difficult choice. They came to the realization, you know what? We see that Reliance Church is in a place where their duty is to do what our desire has been. And they made a very selfless choice to, to be able to come and say, you know what? We see that this is what God's doing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take all that we've invested and we're going to entrust it to you. And we ourselves are going to come together and join together with you so that the duty that God has given to you can be, can be realized and fulfilled. We, we would never be in a place today as a church where we would be able to, to glorify and say, guys, here's what's going on and, and we, are, we are this close to, to, to moving in to, to a facility of our own. If it had not been for those that it had, had sacrificed in that way. And so here is just this awesome, beautiful picture. David has this great desire. God says, you know what? I love your heart. I love your desire. But I've got a different duty in mind for you. Now, I said there's a couple of reasons that God said no to David. Certainly one had to do with, the, with, the, the, with David's duty and what his calling for him was. Another reason is found in our third point. If you're taking notes, you can write it down, David's destiny. Notice again there at the last half of verse 11, he says, Also the Lord says to you, he'll make you a house, David. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I'll be his father, he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I'll chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you, Your throne shall be established forever according to all these words and according to all this vision. So Nathan spoke to David. God tells David, listen, I'll build you a house. You want to build me a house? David, I'm going to build you a house. And I'm going to set up your seat after you who will come from your body. And I'll establish his kingdom, his throne established forever. Now, these promises were partially fulfilled in Solomon, David's son, right? And the successor to the throne. Solomon ruled on David's throne. Solomon uh, received God's mercies, even, and they never departed from Solomon, even though he sinned. Solomon built God a magnificent house, and so we see these prophecies partially fulfilled in the life of Solomon, but the prophets foretold a far greater fulfillment of these promises. 
<clears throat> Jeremiah the prophet, he said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David <clears throat> a branch <clears throat> of righteousness. <clears throat> Excuse me. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. And now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. It's speaking of the Messiah. Isaiah the prophet, he said this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Here it is, upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. One further thing, the angel of God declared this to Mary. He said, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. So God is telling David here, listen, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Messiah is going to come through your lineage. He's going to come through your line. And listen, this was a far greater promise than David's offer to God. <clears throat> David said, Lord, God, I want to build you a house. And the Lord God says, no, David, I'm going to build you a house. And you think you're going to do this wonderful thing for me? You have no idea what I'm going to do, through you, do for you, and I'm going to do it through you. Because God would build for David a house that would last longer, that would be more glorious than the temple that David wanted to build for God. God's plan for David was far greater than he ever imagined. Let me tell you, God's plan for you is far greater than you could ever imagine. You cannot outgive God. He has a desire to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond all you can ask or think. And David was promised a house forever, a kingdom forever, a throne forever. He would glorify God's name forever. Listen, all this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the son of David. Spiritual blessings that God offered to David, listen, they're available to us today. To all who trust in his name. Listen, here's what Paul said to the Ephesians. He says, in him, Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In him, Jesus Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to to the counsel of his will. Listen to me. God wants to build you a house today. He wants to build you a house today. Jesus said this in John's gospel. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Do you have that hope today? Do you have the hope? Do you know that right now, according to Romans chapter 8, that, that Jesus Christ is on the throne of God and he's praying for you by name? The Bible says that his thoughts towards us are more than the sand in all the seashores. The Bible says that you are precious to God, that he so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so often people relate to God and they think, you know, God is just this malevolent being up in heaven and he's there. I'm the ant and he's the little kid up there with a the magnifying glass and he just wants to fry me. No, God wants to save you. And Jesus is praying for you by name and a mansion is being built for you in glory. So much greater than you can ever imagine. And this is God's promise to us in Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice David's response here because he gets it. God has told him, no, broke his heart. I want to build this temple for you, God. God says, no, David, I got a greater duty for you. My, my calling on your life, David, is that you're going to shepherd my people. You're going to take care of my people, and you're going to lead them into a land that's safe, and you're going to, you're going to be used to rid the land of all the enemies. And once you secure that place of peace, then I'm going to use your son, the son of peace, 
to build the temple, just as I'm going to use my son, the son of peace, to build the kingdom and to build a mansion in glory for my people. God's doing this beautiful thing. So how does David respond to this? We pick it up in verse 18. It says, Then then King David went in and sat before the Lord. Hey, listen, what a great thing to do. What a picture right there. You might even want to circle that, put an asterisk by it. You might want to take a walk with that. Maybe today you're here, you're upset because God has told you no. What does David do? He goes in and he sits before the Lord. And he says, who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you've brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. And you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? What man does this? What man, and you go to him and you say, hey, you know what? I want to build you a glorious mansion. And he says, no, no, no. You know what? I'm going to build you a glorious mansion. He's like, who does that? God. Now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, no, your servant. You see the humility in that? He doesn't say, what, you know, the king. He doesn't, you know, oh, I'm the king. It's just David, your servant. He says, what, what can David do, do? What more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. For your word's sake and according to your own heart, you, you've done all these great things to make your servant know them. Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor there is any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name, and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods." For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. And now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. And so let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel, and let the house of your servant David be established before you. Listen, the, 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 the way David responded no to God, it's a good example to us. He starts just humbling himself before God. God says no, he goes to his house, he sits down before God. Ten times in our text here, he refers to himself as the servant of God. You know what, God, I belong to you. And you know what else David does? And you could take note of this because this is healthy, is that David acknowledged God's faithfulness. He acknowledged God's faithfulness in the past. He acknowledged God's faithfulness in the presence. And he acknowledged God's faithfulness in his promise to come in the future. Paul said this to the Philippians in Philippians 4, 6. He said, be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the God of all peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Hey, a healthy prescription there. And maybe you're in a season of no. Maybe you're in a season of, God, where are you? God, you've you've forsaken me. God, what the heck? Can I really trust in you? Listen, be anxious for nothing. Take a walk with, take a prescription from David here. Go sit before, before the Lord and then just take a prayerful walk with, hey God, how have you been faithful to me in the past? How are you being faithful to me right now in the present? What are your promises for me in the future? Because listen, as you're anxious, and we very rarely live our lives in the present. Most often, we live our lives either in the past or we live them in the future. We we either live our lives just constantly focused on the rearview mirror of all that's happened to us, or we live our lives looking to the future and stressing and worrying about the future, right? Right? And Jesus said, look, sufficient for the day is the trouble therein. In other words, today is all, you know, yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, you only got today, man. And so we're to live in faith in today. How do you do that? Man, you do remember the history of how God has been faithful. You do look forward to the mystery of the future by what God has promised you in his word. 
And so whatever it is today, you can say, Lord, you're faithful. You're faithful. You've been faithful then. You're being faithful now. You're going to be faithful in the future. Lord, I can trust in you. I can hope in you. And David concludes, look at verses 27 through 29. He says, For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. Because all the promises that you've given to me, Lord. And now, O O Lord God, you are God and your words are true. And you've promised this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant that it may continue before you forever. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it, and with your blessing, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. Listen, here's what I want you, maybe even right next to these three last verses. You could write this. You could write, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is the cry of David's heart right here. He says, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Listen. There's times in your life when God's going to say no. Jesus has instructed us how to pray. Our God God is in heaven. He is a holy God. Thy kingdom come, Lord. Thy will be done. (laughs) 